I think so. So I think that um, I would uh, love to um, introduce, um, you know, with um, a lot of love and appreciation and recognition, uh, my friend, um, Eric Fredrickson, who in the spirit of the 20th anniversary, he was um, our, um, our, our first uh, director of the SUNY Learning Network. Actually, there was one other one, but we, <laughs> there, that, was, that was a couple years before. But um, Eric is uh, an amazing scholar, an amazing, um, he's going to talk to us today about some research he's been doing in, uh, in the area of online leadership that is fascinating. And I'm just so pleased that you're here. Um, I'm so glad that you don't live so far away so that you could come. <laughs> and um, I just, I'm just going to bring you up and, and have you introduce yourself further. Thank you very much for coming. It's very nice to see all of you. I think um, it's a tribute to the SUNY system that you have so many, I know these people um, spent a, uh, an awful, uh, awfully long time um, working so closely with them. Um, they are a treasure. They're talented, dedicated people, and the SUNY system is very fortunate to have these people. Um, I won't name all the names, um, but you know who they are. Um, my friend here, um, thank you for your kind words. You're certainly on that list. Um, you're, a, you're a treasure, um, and I'm glad to, glad to be here to see you. All right. Uh, I think one thing that Alex um, was referencing is I have been doing some research relative to leadership for online learning. Um, so uh, it was something, you know how this works in terms of research. You start with what you're interested in um, to some degree, and what was um, nice is it turns out other people were actually interested in this in this work as well, and so this is something that has been picked up by Inside Higher Ed and the Chronicle. Um, if you if you're really desperate and uh, you know want to chew up some time, there's actually a podcast interview that's available through our friends at UCF. If you want to go listen to that, uh, I'll even put a plug in here. You can see one there towards the bottom is uh, the online learning journal. There's a couple uh, peer-reviewed journal articles about this research. Um, I didn't mention it before, but I am, uh, uh, it's, I'm, I'm privileged to actually serve on the board of directors for the online learning consortium with a few other, um, Karen, Tony, uh, Peter, other board members that are here today. I'm actually even humbled to um, tell you that I'm, uh, Yes, they're a little bit crazy. They elected me to even be president of that board. Um, but I do want to plug the Online Learning Journal. It's a great resource. Another area where SUNY can be very proud is that the editor of this journal is Peter Shea at the uh, State University of New York at Albany. Um, and so there's been some interest in, in this area. So um, I think maybe that's why, maybe there's more than one reason, but this is one reason I think that Alex wanted me to come talk to you today. So. Um, that's what I'm going to talk about. All right. So, um, why? Why is why is this field? I think um, I think some of it relates to these are probably familiar charts or ideas that not a secret to probably anybody in this room. There's been tremendous growth in online education over the last 20 to 25 years, right? Um, one out of three students in U.S. higher education has been um, is taking. Um, at least one online course. So there's been just tremendous growth and because what goes along with that growth, and you can see it in what your provost um, talked about, is how important it is to the institution. Um, you see my couple, my couple images down there at the bottom. Another sort of, fact, you know, sort of factor that at least weighed on me was related, if you go back to 2012 and 13, do you guys remember a lot of hype in the press regarding things called MOOCs? Massive open online courses. Um, that actually gained a lot of attention at some institutions that may not have been in certain waves of doing online education before this. Um, but it was, I think it was a catalyst. It was at least a catalyst for many institutions to at least start talking about this topic. One thing that went along with some of those conversations about MOOCs, um, maybe Tony can help me out, but there were certain predictions there too, right? About hey, wait a minute, when we do these things, we're not going to need so many institutions. Um, you know, it was this, right? What was that prediction? There was going to be only, like Sebastian Thrun said, there were only going to be 10 institutions in the country over the next 
30 years, 40 years, or something like that, right? Um, this was, so this is what I would show you as the pr uh, prediction. Anybody uh, been to the University of Rochester physically? You guys right? Wow. Awesome. Um, you may recognize this. This is our landmark um, library. This is Rush Rees Library. It's sort of the, you know, primary, you know, one of the primary um, noticeable or notable buildings on our campus. But here was the prediction. Everybody that's been there, I just want to, um, I just want to clarify right now, and Al it's just a special effect. We didn't really do that. Um, but it was that all of our institutions were going to go away. Um, many of them, almost all of them are going to go away. So there's just been a lot of, a lot of institutions and a lot of executives on our, uh, at our institutions trying to figure out what should be happening, what, what institutions should be doing in this area. Okay? So, leading, so leading this, leading up to this, so that I would say we're catalysts for doing this research, we're recognizing, you know, with the growth of, with the growth that I mentioned, with the increased strategic importance to the institution, the visibility by the trustees and senior executives on your campuses, um, it, I think it's understandable that presidents and provosts were um, creating new leadership positions for online learning that may not have existed before. So I was asking this question. So given all that, what do we know about the leaders who are guiding these efforts? And so that was, this is sort of leading you into the research I've been doing, okay? I think I, I hate to like be right here behind the podium the whole time. Turn this one off. I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm qualified to turn this one off. Is there a, you're always saving me like you always. a little bit. Can you guys hear me okay using this? Okay, so, um, hey. All right, so what were the goals of this study? Um, first was develop a systematic comprehensive list of these individuals. Um, and then I had some, some, some uh, important sort of constructs to it. I needed to take, I wanted to take a look at some institutional information for context. And then I wanted to learn a little bit more, collect data around both the individual and the position itself. And then take a look at, um, you know, was there any relationship between any of these factors um, and dimensions? Uh, here are links to OLJ, uh, to the articles if you're interested. These slides, I think Alex will be, will they be, they'll be available. Okay, so. So everybody stop writing down everything I'm saying, okay? Oh, hey, so I had, so in order to collect, you know, to do these kinds of studies, the first was figure out, I'm going to survey all these people, right? What's the first question? Well, who are the people, right? So if you want to do a study of, that relates to presidents at, at colleges and universities in the U.S., you can do that because there's a list, right? If you want to do provosts or deans of certain schools, you can do that because those lists as well. Those lists exist as well. Guess what? Anybody think that there's a list of these individuals? There wasn't. There is now, but there wasn't then. So, what do you do if there's if there's no list? What do you do? What's that? I think that's a different kind of research. Um, uh, that I won't be talking about today. Um, for me, uh, believe it or not, I, I went to all of the institutional, you know, college and university websites to try to figure out who it was. Okay? So, sometimes, you know, these are the sort of pieces or parts that I might explore, you know, org charts, you know, maybe a provost cabinet structure, um, maybe an online organization, uh, all kinds of things, even even down through like campus directories or even press releases. Okay, it was awesome. Sometimes it would only take a couple minutes to be like, 
There's Peter Shea at Albany. I've got him, right? Sometimes um, it took much longer, honestly. Like, and I would tell you, I'm a bit of an optimist, and so I always felt like I was only one more click away from finding out who it was. But uh, some, next thing you know, it's like I'm, in, I'm on one institutional website, and I'm there for like 45 minutes, and I still can't figure out who it was. Um, uh, I would also acknowledge that it's not like there's, a bar there's one single specific title for these roles. Uh, um, so there's some variation, you have to recognize this. Um, I will tell you, I did try to take a systematic approach. I've done this through two studies. I did the first one that I would call university leaders, and I did this by Carnegie, Carnegie, Carnegie classification, the R1, R2, R3, M1, M2, M3 institutions. That was the first study. And the second study were that I did with community colleges. Now the Carnegie classifications for the community colleges is a, um, I didn't find that as helpful, so I shifted my approach to that one and I organized that, that, those searches by enrollment size. And so I took a look at the very large community colleges, then large, then medium and small and so on. Okay? What else do you want to do with your time in the summer anyway? Right? Okay. So I mentioned it led to these two studies. You might say, well, which institutional websites did you look at for these studies? Peter, the answer was all of them. So for the university ones, there were 1,088. For the community colleges, there were 1,024. So yes, I actually went to a, you know, more than 2,000 institutional websites, searched through them, tried to identify these people. I was able, for the university ones, to identify 820, and for the community colleges, more than 750. Um, and you can see the responses for the actual studies themselves here. So we, so we now have this list of more than 1,500. Um, so I guess, uh, so that was approaching the study. Now in terms of starting to begin to help share a little bit about these three general areas, um, I'm not going to go into this um, here. Um, if you're interested, I attend to some of these ideas in um, the first journal article, but it's inst for institutional context, I tried to also take a look at some of the organizational theory about higher education and our culture, um, and I would reference these three. I'm not going to spend too much time on these. Um, if you're not familiar with it, concepts of loosely coupled systems, the idea of organized anarchy, Sounds about right. And uh, the concept of professional bureaucracy. So if you're interested, again, go take a look at the journal article if you're interested in learning a little bit more about some of these concepts. What they try to speak to is sort of how colleges and universities work and function in the sort of interesting complexity of, um, of our colleges and universities and, and, and then helps you think about that context for the kind of leadership that's, that is effective working in those spaces, okay? Okay, so let's get into, you know, what did I find out? So one question that I was interested in was, was a simple one, which is how do, you, how do you and your institution define online learning? Like, what's your scope? Here are the results. Now, potentially, and maybe contradictory to some historical views that the online learning is about distance education um, exclusively, that's not what these leaders are saying in terms of how scope is defined for them. The majority in both cases, the university study, the community college study, say they, they define it as impacting all of their courses, okay? I did try to, and I'll show you maybe a, just a couple examples. I did try to, for all these areas, I tried to take a look at, you know, you know, beyond the summary data, what could I learn? For example, were there differences in this um, for different types of institutions? So was the response different from R1s versus M3s or something? So I did take a look at it. It's not identical, but it, I didn't see statistical significance across those responses. For the community colleges as well, they were, they were not identical, but they weren't statistically significant. 
What else did I ask? I asked, relative to institutional context, I asked about strategic goals. So what are the highest strategic goals for online learning at your, at your institution? So this is the response for university leaders. Um, this is probably not readable in the back, right? Or in the middle. Alex, can you read this? All right, so if everybody would just come up, sit with Alex. Now, you can see this. The, these are the responses up the, um, on the right-hand side. That first one, the highest one for the university leaders, um, the highest strategic goal related to growing total institutional enrollments above existing levels. For the community colleges, it was just a little bit different. Now, it's not like they would, the community colleges were not saying that that was important as well. But in terms of what they cited more, the more, um, uh, the highest um, rated one for the community colleges was actually enhancing student retention. So that's what we, that's what we saw for strategic goals. Another one I was really interested in is when these positions were created. Here's the response on the left, on the left hand side for the universities and on the right hand side are the community colleges. And I saw something interesting here, I thought was interesting, which is for university leaders, the majority of these have been created in the last you know, five or six years. But for the community colleges, the majority have been in place for much longer, you know, seven, eight, ten plus years. So an interesting, I guess that, that's also an interesting part for me was after doing both, being able to compare, were there differences or similarities um, between the two? This was one that was interesting. To, it's all interesting to me, right? Here's another one that was interesting to me, which is I, was, I wanted to know whether the institution was using online learning efforts as a catalyst for organizational changes at their institution. I thought this was fascinating. Almost three quarters in both cases were saying yes. They're using this as a, as a catalyst for organizational changes. And I felt like, well, I, I'm interested in maybe just a little bit more on this one. Um, so what I did here was, oh, and I did the breakdown. I didn't see statistical significance across the different institutional types or sizes. Um, but I wanted to know, well, okay, what groups um, at your institution have been unified at your, in this case, this is the university study results. And again, only Alice can see these, so I'll just give you a sense, like, this is academic educational technology, instructional design, faculty IT support, not ID support, library support for faculty, the LMS, online learning policy development, faculty development and training, the Center for Teaching and Learning, Course Design and Multimedia Development, or this was in this case, we didn't have any changes, okay? For me, I just drew a line, you can, I don't know if you can tell, a little red line at 50%, so I was trying to take a look at, okay, at least half of the institutions responded um, that, that there were six that were being unified um, within this type of organization in, under this leader. And it was the academic technology, instructional design, the LMS, online policy development, faculty development and training, and course design and multimedia development. Those were the things that were being unified. And guess what? I saw something very similar um, in the community college study. This one is a little, um, I expanded this one because it came the second year. I, I was interested in maybe there were some other areas that should have been asked in the first one, and so I asked a few more about marketing, advising, student services, educational research. Um, we saw some of that happening, but again, in my sort of made up threshold of 50%, it didn't, it didn't pass that. But the other ones are there. The other six were there. Okay. Everybody still good? Hang in with me? All right. How about top priorities or issues? What were the top priorities or issues? So this, again, is the response relative to the university leaders. What's up top? Faculty development and training. No one in this room is shocked by this, right? Alex, this is where you help faculty and support them. So that's what that means. OK. Uh, strategic planning and then staffing for instructional design and faculty support. 
Okay? So those are at least the top three. What did we see for the community college leaders? Faculty development and training was also number one for the community colleges. But it's interesting to note that community colleges actually um, ranked providing student support as the second one. Is number two in that list. All right. All right. So that was a little bit of relative to some institutional context that I was looking for uh, and looking at here. Let me shift and maybe say a few things about because um, I want to go into say uh, sort of sharing a little bit about what I found relative to the position and the individual. Okay. Again, I'm not going to. If, you, if you're interested in the sort of theoretical concepts behind some of this, I will note these and encourage you to take a look at the journal article. All right, so one that I was interested in um, was for these individual leaders, do you also have a faculty appointment? Not to be confused with saying do you have you know, teaching experience, but actually do you hold a faculty position um, at your institution? I saw some differences here. So, um, one for the university leaders, it was, you know, it was interesting split. It was almost a, you know, almost perfect here. But a quarter saying yes, a tenure track position. Um, another quarter yes, but a non-tenure track um, faculty position, and no was was the other half. It was a little bit. You can see the the breakdown for the community colleges. So I saw some differences across these two studies for this question. And again, I did a breakdown, um, taking a look at if there were um, any differences here across the Carnegie classifications for the universities and for the community colleges. They're not identical, but there was nothing statistically significant across those two. Okay. All right, so um, does anybody in the back have any questions about this slide? <laughs> Probably good that this will be shared. What is this? What am I trying to represent? I'm trying to expedite you through some of this. And so, what is this representing? It relates to professional background and experience of the individuals. So, I was interested beyond that faculty appointment. I was interested in finding out: Do individuals have face-to-face -face classroom teaching experience? Do they have online teaching experience? Do they have educational research experience? Do they have you know, sort of broader management leadership experience? Do they have backgrounds in instructional design? And do they have IT experience? So these were at least six that I tried to take a look at. The bars across, um, I know it's obvious, but what this, what this represents is, you know, less than a year, or the, the first bar is I don't have any, less than a year, one to two, and so on. It gives you sort of number of years across there, so how much experience they might have in a different area. I know this is not readable, so just hang with me for a second. All I'm trying to represent here is that you can see, um, you know, at least recognizing the bars over here, you're seeing people say, I've got management leadership experience. I've got instructional, some instructional design experience, right? It was not identical, but similar sorts of charts for the community college leaders as well. So what I'm trying to share with you is um, that these individuals have a very, um, what I might even describe as essential blend of experiences that are really important to be effective, in my opinion. Evie. So the question had to do with almost maybe how I'm, in, how I'm representing that data, in this case in the management and leadership box here. So this is saying like 20% um, of the respondents, the, in this case at community colleges, 20% are saying I have one to two years experience in terms of management leadership experience. Okay? The blue bar is only 1% of those leaders said that I don't have any, okay? The interesting one is the blue bar is, 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 is somewhat small for most of these, except for one, and it's the IT one. 
And that was the case, if I went back to the university leaders, same thing. The blue bar was the highest for IT experience. This is where I sort of just throw out my interpretation, right? Because I'm the author, I can interpret this. <laughs> um, I, don't th I don't think what this is telling us is that IT is not important. That's not how I'm interpreting that. The way I interpret this is, it's possible that this individual leader may not have IT experience, but they more than likely depend on and count on sort of partners in an IT organization at their institution that has all of that experience. So that's how I might interpret this. And it does get into another question that I have um, that I'll share with you that relates to reporting relationships in just a moment. Okay. All right, so again, my message on these couple are just this idea of there is a, a blend of experience across these different areas that I think lead to someone being very effective in these roles. Okay. Else, are we okay with time? Okay, I've only got like three more hours of stuff here to share with you. All right, um, if you're interested, I asked age, you know, which was, you know, Peter, obviously you and I were over here in this little red bar. And there's the community college. So you can see people have some, um, maybe it's a stretch to say that there's some maturity given some of the people we know in these roles. Um, I have that from the overall. Um, I don't have a slide for it though. But it's in the journal articles. Okay, the question had to do with gender. So I do have that data, it's shared in the, in the journal articles. Okay, so I asked about age. This was the one I was just uh, mentioning a moment ago. I was curious about reporting relationship. Who does this leader report to? Um, if it's hard to read, the, the blue one is president. Um, this is provost or chief academic officer. This bar is other senior academic leader. This is some other senior or regular vice president outside of academic affairs, the CIO, dean of a school or other. So there's a, I, th I interpret a message here. Um, and maybe this is good, in, good timing. Um, is to talk about the importance of the provost, now that you've walked back in. <laughs> that was really well timed. We had practiced that for, uh, I uh, appreciate this because I think it um, conveys a message because I saw something similar at the community college. Again, maybe the numbers, percentages are not the same, but it's um, a message around leadership for online learning is flowing up through academic affairs. Again, typically to that chief academic officer. Um, that mentioned before about IT is very, very few, very few are coming through the CIO and so my interpretation of this is really about online learning is not an IT function. It, it depends on robust platforms and services and tools, et cetera, that count on IT um, and our friends in IT, but online learning is really an academic activity, right? And I think this, to me, this was, um, I connect that with, this, with these findings. All right, we did that one. I also asked about how many years of experience um, these individuals had, and you can see quite a bit. Um, for the university leaders, almost half had more than 20 years of higher ed experience, and still a, more than a third at the community college. So you, again, you're talking about individuals that presidents and provosts are counting on to be on point, to help, help their institutions with, with um, these important academic initiatives um, are people with lots of solid higher ed experience. Here's, a, here's an individual, you know, sort of biased question of mine that I was interested in as well as I wanted to know if these individuals had been online students. You had that experience as a learner. Um, here are the results. Uh, yes, one course. Yes, multiple courses, some even a complete degree program, and you know, or no, they hadn't. So this is, um, 
I guess you could say for the university, you should talk about two thirds have that experience. It's even much more pronounced in the community colleges. There's much more experience. There's a lot more experience as students um, in the community colleges. Um, so in my mind, this is really an important, um, this is important background, again, to be, I mean, it goes into that, that uh, message around an essential blend of experiences, I think, are, that help someone be effective in these roles. All right, um, I won't spend too much time on these. I was interested in what organizations these individuals you know, and their institutions belong to. Um, I'll just simply say, you know, OLC, ELI, um, QM are showing up, um, you know, pretty, pretty well represented in these charts for the university leaders. Um, similar for the community college leaders, the only thing I added for the community colleges was the League for Innovation because I know there's been, um, there's a lot of appreciation for that, um, that organization and it was well represented here. Um, I asked about, you know, how people stay connected and informed. It's interesting, it's research and their peers um, are, are high on their conferences and associations. Um, that's for the university leaders. For the community college leaders, another one that sort of showed up really high were state organizations. I think I might hear um, say that I would commend, you know, Alex and the rest of the team here for having events like this because this is I think falls in that category and where people are counting on this for um, staying informed and staying connected and in, in, um, supporting their professional development as well. Um, I had lots of sort of qualitative open-ended questions. I'm going to just share one because I thought it was interesting. Um, I don't know if you can tell. So the sooner that online education is widely as understood as an expansive concept that is integral to most everything we do in higher education, the better. Um, how about the one that part in red? I look forward to the day when online education, understood broadly, is the default, and there are specialized people working in the office of time and place-bound education, supporting those who work within the limitations of a traditional classroom. I, I'm glad to at least hear a couple chuckles, because I didn't want to feel like I was the only one that found some humor in that comment. But interesting. All right. Let me just sort of wrap this up, um, summarize. So what were the key findings here? Um, counter to a, that idea of a strict focus on distance education, most are talking about having responsibility for supporting all of the academic offerings of their institution. Again, in both cases, almost three out of four report using online learning as a catalyst for organizational changes. The majority are reporting up through academic affairs. And these positions are being held by very seasoned leaders, which is important because these are the people um, that presidents and provosts um, are counting on and leaning on to help guide and lead um, their efforts. Um, I mentioned that you know, being able to do two, I was able to do a little bit of comparison. Like, so where do the universities and community colleges, um, what do they have in common in terms of these results? And so here's where they, here's where they you know, agree, uh, or areas that they have in common. It had to do with scope, catalyst for organizational changes, the units that are being unified in their organization, reporting line, faculty development and training, top priority, um, years the individuals held a position, and so on. So that's where they were the same. In terms of where they differed, it seemed like university leaders were more likely to have a faculty appointment, to have a doctoral degree, um, the community college leaders were more likely to have online student experience and have been in place longer. This idea for community colleges focus on, on student retention as compared to growing enrollments for, at the university. Um, I did see community colleges a little more likely to, have, to use service providers, but don't interpret that as something that they are, and what I mean by this are the professional, op, you know, or um, you know, private sector OPMs. Um, it's, it's not a very high percentage across either one, but relative to each other, community colleges seem to be a little bit more inclined there. Um, connecting to state agencies. I will tell you that in terms of gender, um, I saw 61% uh, um, in the community colleges being female. In the university leaders, it, honest to God, it was an identical 50-50 split. 
So it seemed like there were more female leaders in the community colleges. So that was another interesting um, aspect of this. All right, moving forward. So this, these were these two studies. I would tell you that it's not gonna end here. Um, anybody familiar with Chloe or heard that term? Know this report, the changing landscape of online education. Um, these were sort of ha initially happening in parallel and so that's when you have a, that moment as a researcher and you start to freak out a little bit saying, oh my God, someone else is doing exactly what I'm doing right now. Um, but in terms of getting connected with this activity, it turned out that what we were doing was very complementary. Um, and so at this point, I'm working collaboratively and we're um, with Ron Lagan and Richard Garrett and we have now uh, done Chloe 3 that will be out within the next month or so I would say and then we'll also be starting to conduct Chloe 4. Um, Chloe 3 analyzes these six areas down here at the bottom and I would just let you know that this work is not ending and it's going to be continuing through this and you might be of interest. This, this might be another resource you might be interested in. All right. How's that? Excellent. Good? Thank you. Um, I want to make sure that we have uh, time for a, a couple of questions. And so who has the first question? Yes. Uh, hi, Doug Kemphill, instructional designer from SUNY Oswego. Can you go back to the uh, multiple slides where you were looking at the time frames people had in different experience fields? I can try. <laughs> Uh, oh, yeah, those. Okay. So I was wondering, um, was there any more discrete data within that on what people viewed as management and leadership experience, instructional design experience, and IT experience? I, I, I used those terms and left it for the individual to interpret, um, use their own interpretation of those terms for re the responses. I'm curious, uh, if, from my perspective, uh, specifically within the ID and the IT fields, uh, what their individual uh, definitions of those were, especially since uh, I think a lot of the IDs here will agree with me that one of the challenges we uh, have traditionally faced is getting people to understand exactly what we do. And I'd be curious whether uh, the definition that these people were using when they said, yeah, I have ID experience matches with what we would yeah, consider yeah, yeah. ID experience. So. A, I think it's a really good point, Doug. And I would actually tell you, um, um, because I've, I've learned from so many good people, um, I recognize uh, that value as a leader, um, for these kind of leaders, to have instructional design experience and know what we're talking about. And so, uh, uh, again, I did leave it up to their interpretation, but asking the question was my sort of way of trying to underscore the importance that individuals in these roles need to have that appreciation. Tony Picciano okay. from City University. Anybody else have another question? <laughs> Anybody else in the room? I love you, Eric, you know that. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think the data is very, very interesting and it really tells us a lot about the characteristics of, of the leaders. Uh, early on, you did have a slide there that distinguished online from blended, hybrid, and yep. web enhanced. Yep. It would seem to me, and not that I know this because we have very little data, particularly on the blended and the web enhanced, whether there are some real differences between the leaders who are in institutions that are primarily doing fully online work versus those who are doing blended or web enhanced. Yeah. And the last two kind of get I don't mean to use the same term, but kind of blended together. We don't have any good definitions for that. So yep. I was wondering, did you detect anything in anything that, that you, you gathered here? I, I, I did not, Tony, in terms of uh, differences. If someone was um, doing, you know, had only described that their definition was only like complete distance education, I didn't see differences um, across the individual or other types of uh, of uh, factors or dimensions to that, I did not. Um, I do think that recognizing, uh, certainly with the green, when they're talking about all courses, th obviously that does include these as well though, right? Okay. All right, 
Any other questions in the back? Hi, I'm Andrea MacArgle. I'm from Binghamton University. You had mentioned that it took you a very long time to find who the leader of online education is at a particular institution. What percentage, if any, were you unable to find who the leader was um, at a particular institution? Let's go back. I've got that data. So I will tell you, so for example, when I told you that I went through um, identifying these individuals in a systematic way. So for the university leaders, I went through these Carnegie classifications and um, there are 115 R1 institutions in the country. Out of those, I found 112, okay? Um, and you can see the number, so 107 to 100 and so on. So out of the 1,088 institutions uh, in these categories, I was able to identify 820. Okay, next question. Anyone? Yes, thank you. Hi, uh, Brandon Murphy from SUNY ESF. Oh. Um, so there's been a couple of announcements in the last year about universities that are going to be, or you know, centers or community colleges that are going to be created totally around just serving an online audience. Were there any places that you looked at during your study that would fall into that category? And what do you think the implications are of how that would look based on your understanding so far in that sort of business model of an entirely online university versus it being a subset within a university compared to what we're seeing right now with most places? So first, Brandon, I'm going to recognize you actually snuck in two questions, right? <laughs> okay. The first one I would say is that um, I did not sort of tease out, you know, sort of, you know, um, sort of superstructure or sort of unique sort of, I, I went solely, you know, in order to organize this, um, um, I really stuck to what is listed as an institution in the Carnegie system, okay? Um, so. Uh, so it really is based on that. I will tell you, that did include, like in some of these, uh, uh, that I'll uh, admit to you that there are, for example, there's some private sector institutions in some of these categories. In my study, um, I found it next to impossible to um, find who those individuals are in the private sector for-profit institutions. Um, their websites are not, don't, so this is just my take on it. But my take is they seem very focused on prospective students and um, like our institutional websites at, you know, in the public and private, not for profit sector, we seem to like have institutional websites that have multiple purposes and share lots of information. It was very difficult to find an individual in the, pro in the for profit sector here. Chloe has, our studies going forward have at least started to get a few of those, but again, it's not a huge number yet which is, now I'm answering a question you didn't ask. I was actually a little bit surprised at your data with how many reported into the academic structure. Um, really? And I was a little oh. curious what you would do at an institution that, say, had a provost uh, or associate provost that showed online education in their portfolio and also a director of teaching and learning that maybe reported in the IT structure. Can you, ask the, can you ask that question a different way? Because I want to make sure I understand what you're asking there. I, how, would you, how would you tag that data or identify a person oh. when you, when, if you see, say, a associate provost who has online learning in their portfolio, yeah. and yet at the same time also has a center for education technology yeah. or for online learning? So I would count that individual. So if you're saying, like, here's an associate provost in, you know, for online education, um, that's the individual I was looking for. Now they may have portfolio or they, that may be an example of an institution that maybe has um, uh, a decentralized or distributed approach to how they're managing the services and support at their institution. Um, but I would, that, that was the individual I was after. I really wanted to find the, in, if I was able to like talk to every president or provost, what I was interested in is who they might name as, here's the person that we um, uh, point to for this. Okay? Oh, one more question then. I'm Brenda Battleson-White at UB. 
Oh, hi. And, hi. Um, I had just two questions. Uh, first of all, one was more of a comment. Um, I think it would be really interesting to look at this study replicated five years and ten years down. And since you're in the you know 25 to 35 age group, that shouldn't I've be a problem time. for you. Um, Peter, you're going to have to help me with that one. Okay. <laughs> um, also, I, I I wondered if you made any if you found any differences between the data you collected and analyzed for private versus public. Institutions only because there yeah, are there yeah. are different structures of exter external forces that dri can drive the development of certain programs in a private environment versus a public and I, and I mean private nonprofit you yeah, know yeah, like understood. so the answer is yes okay <laughs> all right all right so maybe I'll you might be interested in more than yes. All right, so, did I, so the question there is really, did I see differences in terms of the private versus public aspects? And I did take a look at that dimension. Um, and it won't surprise you that in certain places there are differences, and there are in certain cases there's just complete similarity as well. What I would say in that case is, um, for the most part, I would say almost all, if not all, of the community colleges were in this public space so it really is coming back to this first study and I would say go to the journal article that I wrote and you can see the really detailed um, distinctions that I made where I saw those differences okay um, trying to think if I could give you a good example I, I think I was um, y yes maybe one that would completely shock everybody in this audience um, and that would be for the publics when it came to like remember that list of issues Funding and resources were seemed to be a little bit higher up for the public institutions compared to the private. Surprising or shocking? All right. How about a bonus, Alex? Okay. You want bonus? So let's go all the way to the end um, because I didn't hear anybody ask the question. What about titles? Because I mentioned titles to begin with. Um, so when I built that data set, that contact list to begin with. Sorry. Here, 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 here. That's me if you have questions, there's my email. Bless you, bless you. Um, I thought I'd just mention, I did collect titles, and so you'd say, well, what did we see? Any differences there as well? Um, anybody, uh, you guys familiar with Wordle? I wasn't sure like how to analyze those, those. and so what I ended up doing was, you can tell me it was a bad idea, but here's what I did. Um, which is I use Wordle and I put in those titles for um, each of the like the Carnegie classifications and then the size of the community colleges and this is what I saw here all right so for R1 institutions you can see you know you know you know vice provost or vice president or associate vice provost or vice president um, seem to like you know you can see the size of that there and as you go down through these these you see some, you know, it starts to shift, right? Still there, but as you go down through, like, it shifts to being less pronounced in terms of provost or vice president or something to director positions, okay? So this is how I um, uh, tried to approach this question about titles. For the uh, very large community colleges, you did see this as well. You saw um, dean or director um, or vice. And then same sort of concept as the organization probably reduced in some level of size and complexity. Um, it changed there too. So there's my bonus for you, Alexis. I did take a look at titles. Thank you. Had enough much. of me now? Yes. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. So um, Eric is going to be here for the rest of the day, I think, uh, at least till the afternoon. And um, so if you have any additional questions, I hope you will um, find him and, um, and, uh, and be nice to him again. Um, one of the things I'm uh, trying to do with this anniversary is to sort of reflect on uh, the past. And uh, of course, um, here we are in the present. And we are also in the process of looking to the future and what's next. And um, and so mm -hmm. I'm just going to share one small um, memory of uh, of Eric. Um, it's it's kind of tangentially mm -hmm. related to the summit. Um, Eric, do you remember that 
we took our first online class together, um, probably in 1997, and it was Ted Bretterman's um, ETAP 680 in, at the University of Albany in the Department of Education Theory and Practice, and we took that course together. I don't know if you remember. Um, but anyway, I was looking through. <laughs> Um, all right, so we're going to transition um, um, from uh, from one presentation to the next. I'm sorry, are you okay? Okay.